Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you, Brian. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Of course, it's wonderful to be here. The didactic that I'll give today was assigned by Brian to me a couple of months ago, so I was glad to explore eosinophilia for the 50th time. I can remember all the things that cause it, but uh, we'll run through eosinophilia in HIV-infected people. No disclosures to report. My talk th this afternoon will be uh, a short outline. First, just a word or two about the eosinophil. Um, a, a bit of a laundry list of uh, conditions that are associated with eosinophilia, and then how HIV might modify uh, this list of conditions. And then we'll talk just uh, briefly about a reasonable proposed evaluation of eosinophilia in, in people who uh, have HIV infection. So first, just a, a reminder that uh, the eosinophil is within the granulocyte uh, cell line. It has a plasma or blood half-life that is around 12 hours, but the cells last much longer than that. Uh, they are, reside mostly in tissues where they can live there for, for many weeks. Uh, they have a variety of, of functions that include presenting antigens, a lot of uh, cytokine expression that are usually anti-inflammatory as opposed to uh, cytokines from other cell types. Uh, they degranulate in response to uh, helminth infections and some parasitic infections. They have a a role really in maintaining immune homeostasis and, as I mentioned, kind of inhibitory cytokines that they elaborate uh, most frequently. Um, when they're trying to kill something, they have a lot of toxic proteins in their granules, major basic protein, eosinophil cationic protein, eosinophil peroxidase, and then a neurotoxin also exists there. When we talk about somebody who has eosinophilia, we define that as an absolute eosinophil count that's greater than 450 to 500 or a percent that's greater than 5%. So the, the categories of conditions that can cause eosinophilia are listed here. The most common by far is just an allergic sensitization. Uh, in this case, eosinophils are usually on the lower end of abnormal with uh, uh, typically less than 1,500 per absolute uh, for an absolute count. Parasitic and other infections that I'll talk about in a minute, cause eosinophilia, autoimmune diseases, primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes that can either be bone marrow derived or, and even if they are, uh, eosinophils in the presence of tissues uh, lead to some uh, tissue damage and fibrosis. Some malignancies are associated with eosinophilia. Immunodeficiency syndromes that are often uh, recognized in childhood, so less, uh, less the purview of adult internists and then some miscellaneous conditions that are uh, generally pretty rare. So first, uh, allergic sensitization. As I said, the eosinophil count is typically less than 1,500 here, and common conditions like allergic rhinitis, uh, asthma, atopic dermatitis, or chronic sinusitis that uh, uh, is associated with nasal polyps that you see in people that have aspirin hypersensitivity. ABPA, is associated with elevated EOs and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. I'm not sure why this isn't categorized as a primary eosinophilic syndrome, but it's not. BALs need to be greater than 40% EOs to uh, have that classification. And then drug allergies, including DRESS, and the more common an uh, uh, drugs associated with uh, allergy are antibiotics, beta-lactams, anticonvulsants, older ARVs, efavirenz and nevirapine that we don't use very much anymore, allopurinol and NSAIDs. So this is uh, just a, a, a table of, kind of an intimidating table of, of infections associated with, with eosinophilia. One a guiding principle to remember is that if the infection is tissue dwelling or skin burrowing in the case of an ectoparasite, then those are the ones that usually uh, trip uh, eosinophil production. Whereas those that are living in the lumen only or those that are associated with cystic disease, but those cysts are intact, then those are usually not associated with eosinophilia. If they rupture, if the cysts rupture, or if a luminal agent starts to burrow in and become more invasive, then it'll trigger an eosinophil response. The conditions in green are those that you might more commonly encounter in patient, patients who 
reside in the United States. Uh, so among the nematodes, Escheriasis, hookworm, strongy, trichinella, we have some in the Northwest uh, in, uh, in Alaska that our Alaskan colleagues can maybe tell us about. And Toxocara conus um, is an infection that causes visceral, visceral uh, larval migraines more common in children than adults. Filaria flukes and protozoa are typically not uh, pathogens that you would encounter unless your patient is from uh, the developing world or has uh, resided there for several months, then they might pick up one of those, but they're not typical pathogens we'd encounter. Among the fungi, uh, coxi, uh, coccidioides my, uh, mycosis, uh, that, that's the one for reasons that are poorly understood is associated with uh, eosinophilia, much more so than histoplasma or crypto. The latter two can cause eosinophilia, but usually in the setting of a disseminated infection, when you might uh, knock off your adrenals, and then adrenal insufficiency is probably the cause of eosinophilia when you encounter it in those infections. ABPA, I already mentioned, and then we'll talk in a moment about how HIV itself might be responsible for eosinophilia. So autoimmune diseases, EGPA, or uh, it used to be called churg strauss disease, is associated with uh, hyper eosinophilia, inflammatory bowel disease. Some granulomatous disease like sarcoid can be associated with eosinophilia, and IgG4 disease, uh, uh, another autoimmune phenomenon, also associated with elevated EOs. Primary eosinophilic syndromes uh, affecting all kinds of uh, tissues can be idiopathic, and, you, and eosinophilia in these conditions is usually quite high, much higher than 1,500, and is associated with some organ damage. Myoproliferative disease occurs with splenomegaly, heart disease, thrombosis, and can evolve into a chronic eosinophilic leukemia. And then some lymphocytic infiltrative diseases of the skin. Uh, these uh, put patients at risk for uh, T-cell lymphomas. Some T-cell lymphomas are associated with HTLV-1, which is associated with uh, eosinophilia. And then uh, eos episodic eosinophilia, this Gleach syndrome, I'd never heard of it before, cyclic fevers, hive angioedema, and elevated IgM and EO levels. Some malignancies. Uh, uh, acute and chronic eosinophilic leukemia. I mentioned uh, T-cell lymphomas are associated with high EOs, as is Hodgkin's disease, and then chronic leukemia uh, due to eosinophilia. And then some other malignancies, adenocarcinomas of the GI tract, lung cancers, and other squamous cell cancers listed here, uh, as well as thyroid uh, cancer, uh, can trip the development of um, eosinophilia. Uh, these immunodeficiency syndromes are, are usually recognized in childhood. Uh, Job syndrome, Wiscott-Aldrich, which is X-linked, and then ADA deficiency. All of those, I don't know the mechanism for hyper eosinophilia in those cases, but it is an observed condition. And again, usually picked up um, in childhood, so not the purview of, of uh, internists. And then finally, uh, miscellaneous condition. So uh, solid organ transplant rejection. Uh, graft versus host disease, and another disease I'd never heard of before, Kimura disease, which has a predominance uh, in Asian males. It presents with head and neck masses, uh, very much like epithelioid hemangiomas, usually developing around the ears, and these conditions um, occur with elevated eosinophils. And then we all might remember uh, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, which was associated with contamination of some supplements with L-tryptophan. So that was the inciting uh, antigen causing eosinophilia. And then for any gourmands who were uh, gathering uh, uh, de uh, aniline de denatured cooking oil from Seville, that was also associated with a hyper eosinophilic state. Adrenal insufficiency, as I mentioned, that's usually the absence of steroids, everybody knows that if someone has elevated EOs and you give them prednisone, they go away immediately. So the uh, absence of endogenous corticosteroids, it makes sense that that would be associated with high eosinophils, sometimes irritated serosal surfaces, and then cholesterol emboli uh, can rarely do it. But these are all uh, unusual conditions. Uh, so what about uh, uh, elevated EOs in HIV patients? The reported incidence is up to 28% in some papers that are listed at the bottom here, but that includes people who have emigrated from uh, countries where parasites might be more endemic. So you'd be picking up individuals with uh, helminths or certain uh, ectoparasites that might be associated with high EOs. 
The higher rates are associated with individuals whose T-cell counts are low, uh, less than 200, uh, or even less than 50, representing untreated patients or those that might have disseminated infections leading to adrenal insufficiency, leading to hypereosinophilia. Skin rashes uh, are also uh, track with the development of high uh, or of elevated eosinophils, uh, eosinophilic pustular uh, folliculitis, and atopic dermatitis more associated with eosinophilia than is parigonodularis or PPE, uh, the papular pruritic eruptions. Foreign-born persons who have HIV are more likely to have high EOs, and especially those who have uh, serological evidence for schistosoma or strongy. And then anyone who's lived in the tropics for three months in a, in a couple of papers, that tracked with the development of elevated eosinophils. There have been three reports of uh, strongyloides hyperinfection developing in people start shortly after starting uh, antiretroviral therapy, so reported as an iris condition in people initiating antiretroviral therapy. Maybe uh, much like zoster happens more commonly in the year after people start antiretroviral therapy, something about uh, immune recovery can lead to some aggravation of the filaria and they uh, uh, set up an auto-infection cycle. So how, how would uh, HIV itself cause eosinophilia? Well, one a proposed mechanism is that uh, HIV uh, is marked by a shift in a T helper cell phenotype from a Th1 phenotype, which is a pro-inflammatory phenotype where the helper cells are working with CD8 cells to develop a cellular immune response. And the Th1 phenotype also expresses a lot of inflammatory cytokines. With HIV infection, CD4 helper cells tend to shift from a Th1 phenotype to a Th2 phenotype, which is associated with humoral immunity and also elaborates different cytokines. In this case, IL-4 and IL-5. IL-4 is important for the production of IgE, and IL-5 is important in the production of eosinophils. So kind of an allergic response that is more associated with a Th2 phenotype, which is what you see in untreated HIV-infected people. So then, if these are all the causes that, uh, of eosinophilia, then what should be a, a reasonable workup when you have someone who's HIV positive and has eosinophilia? So I think all patients deserve a detailed HNP, uh, recognizing their country of origin, any extended travel to the developing world, medications, especially antibiotics, anticonvulsants, older ARVs like nevirapine and efavirenz and NSAIDs. And if you find uh, offending medications, discontinue them if possible. Don't forget about uh, uh, ABPA and disseminated COXI as uh, rare cases in anyone. Untreated patients with HIV because of this uh, change in Th1 to Th2 phenotype <clears throat> can be the, the responsible uh, explanation. And starting antiretroviral therapy and where you might see a reversal in that uh, TH, uh, so TH2 going back to TH1 phenotype uh, might be important. Those individuals with very low CD4 counts, don't forget about in disseminated infections. They could just knock out your adrenals, and it's adrenal insufficiency that might lead to hyperosinophilia. And then consider doing this in most patients, but especially those with foreign, uh, who are foreign-born or have significant travel. Stool and urine studies for ONP, uh, the biofire that we order on stool all the time uh, will not pick up uh, the pathogens associated with uh, hyperosinophilia. That'll pick up uh, cyclospora and cryptosporidia and giardia, but those are generally luminal agents and, uh, and typically not associated with eosinophilia. So don't think that you're going to get away with, with not doing stools for ONP. If people have uh, serologies that are positive for schistosoma and strongy, then uh, you can treat those pathogens, schistosomiasis, with a one or two day course of praziquantel and strongyloides with ivermectin. But remember, if you have somebody from a developing nation who might have uh, cryptic loa loa, you have to, it's a little risky putting them on ivermectin. You just have to know about that and get ready to treat that. And that gets treated with something uh, completely different. And then remember, in, in those individuals who develop uh, eosinophilia shortly after starting antiretroviral therapy that they might, if it's a marked eosinophilia, they might have strongyloides hyperinfection, and you could look for that um, for the rabidiform larvae in, uh, 
in uh, stool and, and sputum. If patients have evidence for end organ damage associated with eosinophilia, then consider these autoimmune uh, and primary eosinophilic syndromes and get uh, tissue biopsies, ANCAs, and an IgE4 level. And then if you still don't have a good explanation for it, uh, don't forget about occult malignancies that can do it, and then uh, the rare causes that uh, we talked about earlier. So a quick summary, eosinophilia in HIV-infected persons is more common in those with untreated disease and those who have low CD4 counts. Investigations and treatment should be dictated by the patient's circumstances, where they're from, where they've traveled, what medications they're on, what their T-cell count is, uh, and any discovered pathogens or conditions that, that you diagnose. And most patients who have idiopathic asymptomatic eosinophilia and there's no evidence that they have drug allergy or a cryptic infection, most of those patients will resolve on antiretroviral, or the eosinophilia will resolve on antiretroviral therapy, suggesting that maybe it's the immunologic effects of untreated HIV that were to blame for the condition in the outset, and ART is going to switch that phenotype back to a Th1 phenotype that would not be associated with uh, uh, eosinophilia. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.